So the military police had come, saw that someone had smashed the control panel for the lights, got there, saw, saw, saw that someone cut the lights, and saw some random dude with a, a, a wooden, <laughs> wooden torch, <laughs> fire torch, walking around and assumed I was a treasure hunter. And so they stormed the castle, man, trying to catch me. Hello and welcome to Two Beers Till Takeoff, the podcast inspired by conversations overheard at the airport bar. Join Phil as he grabs a couple of beers and chats with interesting people from around the world, sharing expert knowledge and hilarious stories that you won't find in your guidebook. So pull up a stool and get ready for an adventure as we explore worlds of travel and beyond with Two Beers Till Takeoff. Four hours in a Taliban headquarters. I had dog meat in Laos. Was it a golden retriever? Smack a dirty old smooch <laughs> on our beautiful fish right here. He didn't die, but he fell down the side of the mountain. Hello, and welcome to Two Beers Still Takeoff. My name is Phil, and my guest today is a Canadian traveler, professional adventurer, and TV host. You may know him from his podcast, Against the Odds, from his YouTube account, Fearless and Far, which has almost 1.5 million subscribers, is that good? Or from his Emmy-nominated TV show, Uncharted Adventure. Welcome to the show, Mike Corey. Thank you. Wait, wait. Um, For the audio listeners at home, there it is. Oh, Um. yeah. Some (laughs) ASMR, baby. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) What's going on with you, dude? Cheers, man. Um, A lot. Uh, Right now, I'm in Mexico uh, doing a skydiving certification. Which has been a fun oh, time, yeah. throwing yourself out of a plane. Actually, the first time I did that was in Moncton, and that was like six <laughs> years ago, and now I'm trying to learn how to do it uh, all by myself. I've been kind of following along on your, your Instagram. It kind of seems that you're, you're now you're doing it by yourself, like not tandem. Well, what's funny is you'd think you'd need more than, than six skydives to jump out of a plane completely yourself. Uh, actually, you'd really do it by yourself on the first jump, but you have somebody there holding you as you're falling through the air and then you pull your parachute and then you actually fly through the air and land by yourself with a walkie talkie. But after six jumps, you do it completely solo. You think you'd need way more than that, but hell it's, it's a hell of a rush, man. When you jump out of that plane all alone for the first time, you, I mean, you, I guess you feel like if I can do this, what, what else can I do? You know, everything else just kind of falls to the, to the wayside. Yeah, you, you just keep thinking of like all those reportings that were like one skydiver died died today and in a tragic. Uh, you're just like fuck. fuck. <laughs> yeah, don't you don't listen to those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, don't listen to those. But that's awesome, dude. That's yeah. Congratulations on that. But listen, I want to start from the top. How'd you fall in love with traveling? Yeah, great question. I I fell in love with traveling. I think because I first fell in love with nature, especially the kind of nature that people. Mm, ran away from so we're talking you know the slithery snakes salamanders of of backwoods new brunswick mostly and with that i guess when i was really young my father showed me that a lot of these creatures that people thought were icky or dangerous were actually not they were just misunderstood people thought like a a garter snake could could hurt you whatever um and i learned early on that most of these things we're afraid of are just misunderstood that it's it's just a lack of information and people think they know all these things about the world but they're not true and there's lots of fascinating things about creatures and you can see where the story is going the same thing goes for the world so many places activities cultures religions countries people have these assumptions that are dangerous or they're they're uncool or they just have these these ideas that that are planted in their heads from just living in this box we call society and i i learned at a young age that there's treasure where people are afraid to look and i've just been lifting up rocks literally when i was a kid looking for these creatures and now i lift them metaphorically i guess around the world in terms of countries and cultures and festivals and things absolutely turn Mm. off the news right yeah well it's (laughs) once you leave the system you you come back in you get glimpses and you realize that people are just taught all sorts of false harmful things and if you unplug, you can live a free life that's not controlled uh, <laughs> by what, what you consume. Absolutely. And you've been doing a lot of that living, I feel, I feel like, on your YouTube channel, Fearless and Far, which is amazing. You do some, some crazy stuff, and you're an amazing storyteller. Uh, some would even say you're the king of adventure travel on YouTube. Just some people are saying that. <laughs> <laughs> What's the story behind the name Fearless and Far, and what, is exa- what exactly is Mike Corey afraid of? 
Yeah. Fearless is, is an interesting word because when you hear the word fearless, automatically you assume the person has no fear. I guess you would think that's the definition of the word. But over time, I've realized that that's not necessarily the definition of the word. It's not an absence of fear. The people who we say are fearless, they do very much feel fear. And I first heard a squirrel suit skydiver speaking about this, a guy named Jeb Corliss way back in the day. And he, he, he was about to do some crazy record of jumping, flying through some hole in the wall. And the reporter said, oh, my God, you, you must not feel fear. And he, he snapped at her and said, no, of course I feel fear. I feel fear more vividly than most people. I just decided to do it anyway. Right, and so mm, if squirrel right. suit sky skydivers feel fear, and your favorite rock stars feel fear, and everyone who's doing these amazing things say, "No, I still fear, feel fear. I just do it anyway," then you realize this this attitude of "Oh my God, they're fearless" is not the lack of fear. It is maybe sometimes an abundance of fear, but being able to make action in the face of that fear. So fearlessness is an action, not a state of, a, of enlightenment. You know what I mean? So right. with that, I, I used to have a channel called, fear, uh, sorry, called Kick the Grind, which was a pretty good channel. It was doing okay. And I never, I never really found my path until I kind of just threw my middle fingers up and decided to do exactly what I wanted to do. I was afraid mm. to make content that offended people um because again i've always been really interested in the things that, that were you know eating bugs or uh, you know going to countries like mauritania or congo but i assumed people would get a little bit upset if you saw somebody eat you know cow brains or something like that but in the right context and the right culture you you can you can understand that okay well it might seem strange for our culture it's very actually very interesting and very appropriate for them and so I was afraid to make content like that. I didn't think people wanted to watch it. I loved it. But it was only the time where I decided to be fearless in my own life when I changed the name of my channel to Fearless and Far. And now, like you said, the YouTube channel has grown quite a bit. It's got 1.5 million subscribers. There's all sorts of adventures on there. People might think are reckless. Um, but I'm very tactical, and, and I put a lot of care into crafting these adventures and learning about these adventures because yeah sure like for example scuba diving can be very dangerous if you don't know what you're doing and you just grab you know grampy's old rusty equipment from your shed <laughs> jump in the bay of fun day with the highest tides in the world and you can exactly. die pretty quick however exactly, yeah. you take some lessons maybe you learn how to swim first maybe you go do a paddy course or an acuc course you learn how everything works you make sure the gear's new and it's actually super safe and that that's mm. generally the attitude towards everything people think is dangerous even the skydiving thing people think it's dangerous well yeah people do die skydiving but if you look at some of the the equipment like for example the the canopy like the backpack with the parachute has a device inside that if it's falling at a certain speed, there's a barometer, an accelerometer. If it's falling at a certain speed and the parachute isn't open, it'll open itself. So you could pee your pants and black out, and the parachute no will way. still deploy. They, and, they don't tell you that. No. Well, before doing it. Like, like, I, I, <laughs> yeah, like if I knew that, I'd be more inclined to do that. Yeah, so there's all sorts of interest. Like once you learn more about anything, you start to be like, oh, actually, you know what? There's, that's pretty interesting. Oh, now I feel a bit more safe. But with countries, with travel, with extreme sports a lot of it is just not doing due diligence basically and yeah so with all of that um the fearless and far channel was born and uh we've had some wild adventures to say to say the least getting lost in the backwoods of congo having to turn had having to trade a uh a crocodile for a bed with a pygmy tribe because our bike broke down in a river and then getting attacked by a, a, a green mamba one of the most venomous snakes in the world the boys hit it in the head with a with machete then we all ate the the snake for dinner because again venomous and poisonous are different you can eat things that are venomous but you can't eat things that are poisonous and we learned that lesson that day when we ate green mamba so it's been fun man uh every yeah, i was every, actually just watching this yeah. episode that you're talking about it was yeah. it was awesome it was pretty crazy yeah yeah so so you eat a lot of crazy stuff i think it's kind of a, a natural segue into my next question but you eat a lot of crazy stuff on on the podcast and you're, or uh, the podcast on the youtube you're you're you know you can see be, uh, drinking blood there's insects there's all sorts of stuff that you're you're eating do does mike Corey have an iron stomach or do you get often sick no i get diarrhea all the time 
<laughs> well, that, that's only because, only because I'm eating... Sponsored by Pepto-Bismol. <laughs> For real. I wish they'd sponsor. <laughs> I generally don't get sick, though. The, in the past, excluding some extraordinary circumstances, which I'll say in a minute, I eat a lot of street food. I'll try anything. The, the times I've gotten the most sick is eating a poke bowl at a stand in Costa Rica. So that was like supposed to be like healthy food. And twice yeah. I've gotten uh, food poisoning from hot dogs and bullshit at 7-Elevens around the world. So, uh, but generally street food, I'm, I'm pretty good at. However, there's some exceptions. For example, uh, when I was in the Philippines, I went to the far north, which is basically the wild, wild west. There's, there used to be headhunting up there. You can still go to houses and there's like heads, boop, skulls some places. And um, they have a food there called etag, which is a maggoty meat dish. So vil village elders are given pork and they have to go smoke the pork at home. And they have t in, in these shelves, these like woodshed shelves, they've got one side is called pork for the living and one side is called pork for the dead. So they take this pork and they make sure it's very well separated and they bring this pork to either weddings or funerals dead or alive but since they're doing it in their woodshed man it gets filled with maggots but the maggots have become a feature not a problem so you cook it with the maggots and it tastes like rot rotten milk and I got, <laughs> I got diarrhea for so for so long oh god um but it was really fascinating to be able to experience that we went to a I got served this on a four-year-old's birthday party wow yeah, and uh, imagine imagine doing that at a four year old's birthday party in North America. Oh man! Also, that same day they they beat a live chicken with a stick. It's a it's a, a meal called pinic pecan, and they believe if you beat a live chicken, then the screaming chicken will a, a call the attentions of attentions of the gods. So basically, we had maggot meat and beaten live chicken uh, side by side for this four year old's birthday party. <laughs> Craziest day of my life. Yeah, that that definitely sounds uh, pretty interesting. Hmm. Yeah, some some of your more popular videos on your channel uh, are some are from sorry, they're from some of your travels with the Hadza tribe in Tanzania, mm -hmm. uh, where you were where you joined a baboon hunt. Can you share some of how, how kind of how that was? Right, I was I don't want to say the first one there, but I had heard about the Hadza, um, hearing a guy named David Cho speak about them on a podcast. David Cho. Anyway, uh, yeah, he was on. He was on Joe Rogan, I think. right? I heard it on that podcast, yeah. and I looked it up, and there was no videos of, of this tribe at all. And I was like, "Oh shit!" Um, so I was going to be. I was at the time doing a TV show with the BBC, and we were filming in in um, Zanzibar, an island off of Tanzania, so like right below Kenya. Yeah. And I was working with the the television fixer, like a local guide, and we had finished uh, this piece. We were doing this really cool coral reef that you can find there at the base of Kilimanjaro, like off off the coast. <coughs> and I said, "Hey." I've heard about this tribe called the Hadza. Do, have you, do you know who they are? And he goes, well, yeah, actually, there's only a few left. They live in a very remote part of Tanzania next to this lake called Lake Ayasi. Uh, I have never taken anybody there. I don't really know the details, but I can definitely find someone who, who can help us. And I was like, yeah, man, let's go. So I had my, my camera with me and everything, and we did this trek into the middle of the woods and met this tribe of Hadza that um, really, again, hadn't really been covered before. Maybe they would see the occasional... Like they're not as remote. The world isn't as remote as people think it is. Maybe there's some tribes in Papua New Guinea, maybe in the Amazon that are, let's say, uncontacted. But generally, the world is pretty well connected. So I can't say they've, they've never seen a white guy before. But I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, it, they, they weren't exactly on the path. So w it was funny hanging with these guys because they speak with clicks. And like, for example, one of the guys' name, name was uh, Ngo Ngo. That was his name. And they have pot there. They smoke a shitload of pot. I don't exactly know where they get it from, <laughs> but they love to get high and they love to go shoot baboons. And I said, well, why baboons? And it's because the meat tastes the best. Apparently, it's got this salty taste to it. It's the, it's the munchies, dude. I guess maybe it's the munchies, right? <laughs> so we went out for two or three days hunting. I went back a couple more times, actually, uh, with those guys because... It's so incredible being out there in the wilderness because we're so, even for myself, I spend a lot of time in front of a computer. Like, yeah, I, I travel, but like, like you as well, a lot of our days are spent in front of computers. Yeah. But being out there for two or three days when all we're trying to do is hunt. So you wake up, you hunt. You take a siesta, you hunt that night too. You, you just go and you go and you sleep under the stars. You eat what you catch and they'll eat anything. We're talking, we're talking like marmosets we're talking antelope we're talking little bush babies whatever they caught any kind of bird bats 
anything flying or crawling, we ate that. Uh, and even there are masters of honey. One really cool story about the Hadza as well is they, they have arrowheads, but it, they don't work with metal. So what they do actually to get these arrowheads for their, for their bows and arrows is they, they go and they climb trees and they pull out honey from live beehives and they get stung to shit. But this honey is worth so much money and it's so dangerous to get, they can trade that honey for arrowheads or for whatever else they need, probably for pot actually as well. <laughs> So we got stung by bees. We were hauled, hauling this topaz honey out of trees, and I got to see inside the life of true hunter gatherers. Something that doesn't happen very many places anymore. People might say they they are hunter gatherers, but people who are actually spending most of their day hunting is is very rare. And the Hadza have decided to remove themselves from society, so it's not that easy to get a camera in there either. But we were able to make good friends and to find good contacts and made it happen. And then from then, man, uh, my video got 14 million views, and then now there's been a hundred other content creators go. So. Also, interesting thing, when you go cover something for the first time, what happens after, right? The copycat, copycat effect a little bit, eh? And YouTube especially. But as far as the, the location or the culture or, or the festival or whatever you film, right? If you go blow it up in the sense of like crack it open, put it on the internet for the first time, tourism comes. And tourism can be a beautiful thing. It can save events and festivals and people or it can destroy places or people, right? Yep. I don't know what it's been like there recently. Uh, however, I, I hope that they've been able to manage it well. Um, but yeah, I've heard, I've heard they got. A, I've heard they got a McDonald's. Oh no! I hope not. <laughs> down, they wouldn't. They wouldn't touch it. Actually, the funny thing was, we we uh, one day my guide brought us like just crackers, like bullshit packaged crackers, and these guys hadn't caught anything that day, and it was getting near evening, and they would not touch the crackers. They wouldn't touch them. Because they said that shit's poison. We don't want to. We don't eat your processed bullshit wheat sugar crackers. We only eat basically like meat, 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 and honey. That's what they do. Yeah. Another interesting one that hasn't really been covered that much, I guess, on the subject of honey is uh, I don't know if you've seen the one that it's like this special honey from the cliffs of Nepal. Yeah, it's in Nepal. Have you heard of this? Yeah, it's in a few places in the world, Nepal and also in Turkey. It's from a a rhododendron. So basically these these bees come and they collect the honey and they make the nectar. But because there's a neurotoxin in the pollen, the honey actually can really mess you up. Uh, Yeah. It can even kill you to some extent. But I've actually had it before. I went and did it in Turkey in the north coast on the Black Sea. Nice. You have to you have to eat a lot of it for it to they call it hallucinogenic honey. It's not exactly true. You it'll drop your blood pressure, it'll give you the spins. It can maybe kill you, but you, it's not as hallucinogenic as people say it is, at least from my experience and from what the stories I've heard. <laughs> it is a cool story though, and it is very much like a poison that you eat and it's supposed to help your body. Yeah, absolutely. And I guess it's another great segue to my next question, which was, you know, you've had some psychedelic experiences with some stuff that's a bit stronger than the honey, mm-hmm. you know, like ayahuasca, <clears throat> combo and others. So what are some of the things I guess you've learned from these experiences? I didn't do any drugs at all until I was maybe I smoked pot for the first time when I was 24, 25, quite late. I'm 37 now. Uh, I was a prof- set Why? well. Uh, cause I was fencing like sword fencing for a long time. And we were always told that we were get, we would get drug tested and sometimes we did. So we had to keep stuff out of our system, but I mean, I, I made, you, you had a reason. Yeah, I guess so. But at the same time, uh, there also wasn't a giant desire for me to try. Like I grew up like a pretty straight laced, nerdy, shy kid for the most part. So I wasn't out there like party animal uh maybe like sometimes like i am now i'm not a party animal now but at least i enjoy enjoy a bit more than i did when i was a kid uh and yeah so now again the whole fearless and far attitude is to try everything and to push your limits and discover parts about yourself and do the things you're afraid of and like for me i was afraid of public speaking for most of my life and so my journey through that to becoming a being basically having a phobia of it to a full-time profession of podcast tv show uh, um as well as a pod, uh, YouTube page, has been a very interesting journey I love to share because I feel like I can really speak to how fear controls our lives. So with all of that, though, there's the external adventures of, that you see on YouTube, but also there's like internal adventures you can have as well. So Absolutely, yeah. why not? You don't have to go all the way to Africa to, uh, you know, challenge yourself and 
be afraid, man. You can do that in your in the comfort of your own home. Yeah. Uh, and just recently, actually, I had a very powerful trip here in Mexico where I was invited to an ayahuasca ceremony, and I blew my brains out. Jeez, uh, had probably double the dosage I I sh- I don't want to say should should have because how many sh- cups did you have? I had three cups. Three cups. Oh yeah, shit. Yeah, but the the leader, the shaman, said in the beginning, um, he said, "Listen." Uh, we're going to start the ceremony and you can come up, have some medicine, and then I'll open it back up in an hour. And if you want more, you can have more. And then maybe wait half an hour and have some more. And he said, if you're not, if you, if you're thinking about having more and you're not sure, come up and have more. If you're like, well, maybe I could have a, no, come up and have more. And so with that guidance, Mr. Fearless and Far, who likes to, uh, you know, fight his fears, decided, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to have a third dose, bro. I ended up curled up in the fetal position outside in a pile of leaves, basically saying to myself, it's going to be okay, baby. It's going to be okay. (laughs) Every trip has an end. As God literally opened the door and said, here are the secrets of the universe, you stupid worm. You cannot handle any of it. it. It was terrifying and beautiful and horrific. Man, um... It fucked me up for like three, three weeks, four weeks, actually. Uh, just This is probably a month ago. And just this week, I was finally able to deal with, with what it was. And part of it was I consider myself a guy who can handle his stuff. Like I've put myself through a lot to be able to handle myself in most situations. I wanted to go see behind the curtain, Phil. I was not ready for behind the curtain. I, I was reduced to, again, a quivering baby. And that messed me up for weeks because I haven't felt that way since I was literally a baby. So you, that weighs with you, right? Like it just pulls you right open. And with that experience too, with everything I've done before, I've tried quite a few things. I've been able to, I've realized that your body is kind of like your life preserver in an ocean. As long as you yeah. feel, okay, like my body's here, you know where you are. But if you lose sense of your body and you can't tell if your eyes are open or shut, you are adrift, my friend. You are lost. So I, lo- I, I could, I, I remember as I was losing sense of my body, I was trying to pull this like these leaves closer to me and I, I was squeezing my fists and my subconscious knew my hands were here, but they, one felt like it was a, a meter away. One felt like I, they, were flo- my, they were floating away. And then I, I couldn't tell where my body was. It just didn't exist anymore. And then you lose, yeah, you can't, you, your, your, your finger lets go of the speeding train, you know what I mean? So, yeah. um, but with that, I guess getting into a bit more of a story there, um, with that experience, it was really quite cool because we were in, in Mexico and Belize running into, well, exploring deep parts of the Mayan underworld. Uh, here, for example, I'm just an hour south of Cancun in Playa. You can go an hour from Cancun or Tulum into the, the middle of the peninsula. You can find towns where, okay, they don't speak English. All right. They don't speak Spanish. They only speak Mayan, bro. Only Mayan. My- Mayan? Mayan. My, you're going to say Catalan. No, <laughs> we, speak, uh, we speak like about Mayan people like there's some people of the past. There's still millions of Mayans here. And again, millions that only speak Mayan. And you what can, does it sound like? It's interesting. It's got like a lot of like clicks and... and um, clicks? No way. Yeah, not like, like, not like that, but more kind of like a kind of... It's, it's very strange. I don't want to attempt it because I don't know any words. But um, go to Fearless and Far, my, my YouTube page. You'll probably see it posted next week. Okay. Um, but it was super cool. And like, for example, you can still find treasures. There's caves here that have skulls that were lopped off some virgin placed on a stone pillar two hours inside of a cave and then sat there for so long they became crystallized by the limestone. So there's crystal skulls, Indiana Jones level shit, crystal skulls, two hours in flooded caves. You can still go see. So we were, we were seeing that, these old sacrifice sites that Mayans um, would have sacrificed virgins or willing or unwilling to the rain god Chak because they felt abandoned by their gods at about 900 AD when the empire was falling. It was, there was drought. Mm. And um, I remember like thinking how crazy it was to uh, to be sacrificed, like what that feeling would have been like, and how could you ever agree to that? But you, you probably felt that during your ayahuasca. Trip you have or... three cups of that shit, man, <laughs> and you you see this, you feel this presence, and you are like, "Take me! I am an insignificant moat in a universe. My greatest gift in the world is to give my my body to you, whatever you are, God, universe, the Matrix, whatever it is." Uh, it's incur- in that moment, it made me appreciate how one could 
sacrifice themselves to something they would see. And these guys used to trip. They, they, there was even special pipes that they would bend over doggy style and funnel mushrooms into their, their ass with. That's like how they got high. <laughs> so picture, I think they're one of the coolest cultures, man. Picture these dudes who are, who are shaving their teeth to, to points, like, like a shark, inserting jewels, like jade, in, into their teeth. They, they would take pl- planks of wood, put them on their foreheads of, of babies, and tie it tight, and put a little string there so the baby's head would be flat and cross-eyed. So these guys, flat head, cross-eyed, sharp teeth with jewels, sticking these like winding pipes over their shoulders into their rectums to be able to trip off mushrooms or whatever else, going into caves and chopping off heads of people, putting them there, and that's... that's the Mayans, like it's crazy, and they still exist. I mean, they don't do that's, all of that, but they still like definitely. A party. Man, they still definitely sacrifice animals to rain gods. That still happens here. People don't realize. Like, I love Mexico. People are like, "Oh, Mister World Traveler, Mexico's his favorite country." You don't know. You don't understand. This country is because it's because people go to Mexico. It's North Americans go to Mexico. We go to Cancun. We go right. to Playa del Carmen. And we're like, "Oh yeah, I went. Yeah, yeah, I did the the resort." They don't go off resorts. They don't go meet people that are Mayans. Right. They don't go, like that doesn't happen. Right. That's we we have a, a preconception idea of what it is, and the resort is not what it is. Right. We go. Well, I, I used to shit on people who went to resorts, and then I had someone set me straight because I've been backpacking for like fifteen years now, and I couldn't ever understand why you'd pay a bunch of money to go sit in a spot and did not have any freedom, basically, right? And then someone explained it, listen, I got kids, I got a job, I got a wife, I don't want any more responsibility, I don't want to have to book accommodation, I just want to go, chill, drink some rum and cokes, have the kids be safe, you know, have a date night and just relax, you know, read a book for once. And I understand, I understand, I don't, I I totally get how how it all works. However, I still push people to, you know, a little bit further. Leave the resort, leave the resort for at least one day. Right, right. Maybe, maybe. But no, like, uh, uh, same thing as you. Like, I, I know some, some, some fairly gnarly travelers that only do resorts now, but it's because they have kids. Right. They have it's responsibilities. Mm-hmm. You can't go throw yourself in, in danger's way that much if you have kids. So right. there's, still ways you, there's still ways you can be adventurous, but I, I totally understand now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I still can't believe that you did three cups of ayahuasca. I, I did one and, uh, in Peru in, uh, in November, uh, October and like wild like i i still like to this day i still wake up in the morning and i'm just still like i still can't believe that that happened (laughs) yeah you know what i mean like how how do you how do you explain to someone or how do you share stuff with people for them to understand because they have like i i know i sound crazy when i talk about the stuff that happened and the things that it told me and they're like you were talking with somebody else like what do you mean you know what I mean? Like it's it's so it's it's just it's so sh- difficult to share because the other person has no clue. They can't even put themselves in the in the, the same mindset to understand, right? Yeah, I the the thing over and over. So I, I this is my second was my second time um, trying it. But whenever I take a generous dose of psychedelics, I realize in that mo- every single time I'm like. This is why, this is how religion exists because yeah. you feel a presence, right? And you feel yeah. light and you, 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 it's just, you, you, the, there's no way our, our creation or perception of God originally didn't come from hallucinogenics because it's undeni- undeniable. Yeah. You, you get, you get in that moment and you're like, oh, now I understand why we all sing in church or why, you know, this religion does that or why we, you know, it all just makes so much sense. So now we've demonized psychedelics, but I have no doubt they are the root of all our major religions. Yeah, because I think there's like the uh, the burning bush in the Bible. For you know sure. what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like there's 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 something. It's, For sure, it's, it's definitely there. Mm-hmm. But listen, uh, I want to move on, and we can't not talk about your Emmy Emmy nominated TV show Uncharted Adventure. Congrats, by the way. Thanks, man. It's awesome. It's an awesome accomplishment. Uh, can you describe the, the show for those who haven't seen it and also maybe shed some light on how the show came about? So the show, uh, it, we're, we just finished our second season and it's on the Weather Channel in the USA. So if you have a TV and you've got the Weather Channel, most people do, turn it on, mm. you'll see me. It's one hour 
And this second season was 14 episodes in 11 countries. And we do all sorts of fun stuff. So we, like, for example, one thing I got to do was squirrel suit skydive um, tandem, which is something mm. that is there only one spot in the world you can do it. <coughs> and over the Eiger in Switzerland. Um, and Turkey slept in uh, an old cave church that was carved out a thousand years ago. And we got to explore this, that by a torchlight. And we do... Uh, also, we got to do go ice climbing in. Um, so in glaciers in, in Alaska, they have these rivers and these pits that go down into nothing in the glaciers. These blue chasms, these shafts, and we got to do camp there overnight and then climb through some of these. And so, really fun adventures. And the show came about because uh, I had another show on BBC called The Travel Show on BBC World News. And that led that show led to the other show. But actually, let's go back even further. So I had a YouTube channel first. Right. And one interesting thing happened to get hired by BBC. So I had mentioned that the, sh- the channel used to be called Kick the Grind. And I wasn't exactly... I was making top 10 taco videos or top 5 beach videos. Wasn't happy, getting burned out. And I was thinking about getting a sleeve tattoo for a really long time. But my, my inspirations were, you know, you know, Miss Frizzle from the back in the day? Yeah. From Magic School Bus. All right, so I love yeah. Miss Frizzle. I love Bill Nye the Science Guy, and I love David Attenborough. And I wanted to be like them, some combination. But I was thinking, you know, like BBC doesn't hire guys with sleeve tattoos, and, you know, David Attenborough doesn't look this way. And so if I take that path, then I won't get hired by BBC, and yada, yada, yada. I need some gray hair and. Right, or at least not <laughs> look more proper with a collared shirt and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Uh, however, but I wasn't, I hit like a breaking point where I, money wasn't coming in, views weren't there. And so I was like, you know, fuck it. I'm just going to do the things I'm scared to do with this whole Fearless and Far thing. Got the sleeve tattoo. Lo and behold, one month after I got the sleeve tattoo, I get an email in my inbox from BBC saying, hey, we're looking for an edgy American presenter for our travel show. Are you interested in an interview? And I got the job because I did the thing that I thought that they wouldn't like. Turning out, turns wow. out they wanted. So that's how the universe works, man. Boldness always gets, always gets rewarded. If you have good intentions and you, you know your path and you're not trying to hurt anybody, boldness always gets rewarded. So basically, I got a TV show because I got a sleeve tattoo. I mean, not on, <laughs> uh, only that, of course, right? But it was just a that's funny hilarious. coincidence. And so it went from YouTube originally to then uh, BBC. And I was doing some other freelance TV stuff as far as hosting. And then the new show, uh, yeah, our second season, got an Emmy nomination last year, which was sick. And now we're just waiting to see that's if we're awesome, going to get uh, season three. Yeah, man, that was that was awesome. Uh, how do you guys decide where you, where you guys go? Like which countries you, got, you guys decide to cover in, your, um, in the season? Because I, I noticed that like first first season you kind of did a little bit more of the states you know Maine maybe closer to home and then and this one you're you're it seems like you've kind of like there's no it's not just the U S like you're you're kind of a little bit everywhere yeah uh, originally it was a little bit of my bucket list um, but in all honesty like my job is now to go find my bucket list items and cross them off for YouTube so there's lots yeah. of things that I I would like to do but. Like, we're not going to go to Papua New Guinea to go hunting monkeys on the TV show. <laughs> not yet, anyway. <laughs> not, not in season one <laughs> or season two. So my bucket list has become very uh, eclectic, I guess. Uh, however, some really interesting things were able to come from that. And then from there, it's, you have to think about money a little bit. You know, we can't go to the most expensive countries in the world. We have to balance it out. Like, we have to go to right. country, uh, like states like Maine. And there's lots of cool things in Maine. But also, we're not going to spend a million dollars an episode on Maine, right? Alaska, yeah. maybe, or, you know, Iceland, yeah. Nor- Norway. Right, exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so it, it's a bit of also following where can we do certain adventures. Like, for example, I wanted to try cliff camping, where you see these guys who do, like, multi-pitch climbs on big mountains. They yeah. have to sleep halfway up a cliff on a little platform that's jammed into the cracks. And I wanted to try that. I'm a amateur climber, but we were able to set up that experience uh, on, in, on a ledge in Croatia. So let's go to Croatia. You know what I mean? Mm. And also cool people. I used to travel to think I wanted to see amazing places. And those are nice. But it's the people, man. You, you remember your experiences with people. It's always the goat, the goat herder who gave you the milk tea on the side of the mountain that you remember, not necessarily the view of the mountain. You know, mm. people are the key to travel. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Can't, can't agree more. So I'm looking to get a little bit of a behind the scenes look 
at some of the darker sides of travel. Mm -hmm. So most people associate travel with their vacation. You know, it's their time off. It's the time that they're going to be able to let off some, some steam. But for you, travel and going on ventures is your job. You know, and like sometimes travel can be tough because, you know, you're away from your loved ones and like you're doing like some really tough travel sometimes, you know. So how do you manage being on the road for long periods of time and also the mental aspects of traveling? The hardest part about this job, and I've had it for 12 years now. So when I was about 25, that's when I mm, decided like this is the path I want to take. And in that time, I had an apartment in Mexico City for two years probably 2017 to 2019 and that's it so basically let's say 10 years out of that uh nomadic full-time the hardest thing is while i've got many awesome friends around the world i can't just like go out for beers with the guys and that that's tough sometimes right because yeah you have few people you can chat with you can pull them up on facetime or whatsapp or whatever skype mm. zoom whatever pick one uh, but it's not the same as like going and hanging out with people who get you right and so building a community, while I do have community, it's, it's hard to get together. So times it can, it can get a little bit lonely. You can meet mm. people. Like one of the incredible things about travel I learned early is you show up at a hostel, you go to on a, on a pub crawl with those guys, gals, you can make better friends with someone in a night than someone you've known your whole life just because your yeah, vibe's absolutely. the same. But then you part ways and maybe you see them again a year later, six years later. So that's always the hardest part for me is I've realized that community is very important in my life and having a solid group of people near you is really important and it's really hard to get that. I try to build that wherever I go, but yet I still haven't got an apartment. So um, that's my, actually a big goal of mine this year is to, is to work on that because now I finally see the value. Uh, with that, like, I find it's a bit hard to switch back and forth between content creation and uh, traveling because going out and traveling you you uh, have to be an extrovert for the most part like you're out there solving problems you're meeting people you're being open yep. and then to come back and be a creative it's the opposite you got to sit down on a computer for days on end edit or write or whatever you're doing and i always have like a transition period in between where i have a bit of a existential crisis <laughs> and then i, I got to find my my groove again yeah but with that i've always just been a very curious guy and so this is perfect it's my dream job. I get to do literally whatever, whatever excites me, I get to do. Um, and so if it's skydiving lessons, I can find a way to make that work for my travels as well as my content. If it's hiking up right. Kilimanjaro, I can do that. Or scuba diving or it's, I'm very fortunate to have the luxury of it's, if it's in the adventure realm or travel realm, um, it's an easy fit into my life. And then I also, I get paid to do it for television as well. So, and with that, I learn more about myself. I learn more about the human mind, the human body, how the world works, my place in it. And I can help other people with the same thing because again, I really consider myself a guinea pig in a lot of senses where I put myself through hell, bro, sometimes. And with that, I really try Three cups, I know. <laughs> Three cups, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, from there, I, I try to report back with my findings, you know? Uh, you don't have to do the crazy shit I do, but I... I would love if you listen to my lessons because I really do feel like I can, you know, craw like, crawl back and glean information from these experiences that maybe I don't recommend for everybody, you know? Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. but anyways, let's get into Q&A. &A. Q&A Q &A is just a portion for people to get to know you a little bit better. Yep. So first question, hot or cold? Wow. Um, it should be easy. Uh, I think I might say hot. I mean, you're in Mexico. Fuck it, right? Mm -hmm. uh, beach or mountains? Beach. Bus or train? Train. Cats or dogs? Dogs. Easy. Dogs. Yeah. Can't deal with cats. Mm -mm. Top or bottom bunk? Top bunk, baby. Yeah. I, I picked Top Bunk too, and I, I get a lot of shit for it because um, I used to have a buddy who used to um, we used to go into uh, you know big dorms and stuff like that, and he'd hook up with uh, chicks in the in the bottom bunk. <laughs> so you're just like on top, you're just like oh shit, like, and they put that on? little like towel curtain over the side. Like, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you had a superpower, what would it be? I would love to. <sighs> Hmm. 
speak every language. Boring answer, but that would help me a lot. No, it's more than fly. Yeah. If you could have a beer with one person from history, dead or alive, who would it be and why? I would love, there's a guy named Joseph Campbell, who I've read a lot of his stuff. Uh, He has a very famous quote, that's the cave you fear to enter hides the treasure that you seek. He was a cultural anthropologist, I think. Anyway, studied a lot of cultures, studied a lot of stories, and probably one of the most fascinating guys I've, I've ever had the fortune of reading, but he passed away. So, Joseph Campbell, man, if you're around, it's on me. Maybe on the next uh, ayahuasca trip. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> What's something you never travel without? Strangely enough, I always have a yoga mat. Not because I'm that into yoga, per se, uh, but when I originally was fencing, like sword fencing, I was a sword fencer, then a break dancer, and then all kinds of weird stuff now I do. Uh, I just like to keep my body moving and having like a, an anchor in the chaos. So I always travel with tea and a yoga mat because no matter where I go, and a notebook, dude, notebook for sure. Those three things, I can li- sit, lay, stretch on the mat have some tea, have a notebook, write, and I can have this little cocoon of sanctuary no matter what's happening in the world around me. And sometimes there's a lot happening. Nice. Yeah, I also seen on, I saw on, on uh, I think, Facebook or something that you're like on, you, 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 you train, you do a bit of jits. I do. Jiu-jitsu. I've been doing jits for three years. Actually, it's really fun because you, I got into it because of Bourdain originally. And he was saying nice. how Bourdain used to travel, he used to travel and train and meet people. And I was like, you know what? That sounds a pretty good idea. And so you show up to like Sweaty Boy Cuddle Club and try to kill each other for a while. You become you become pretty fast friends, man. <laughs> so it's great. Yeah. 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 I used to do it too. And then I, I um, tore two meniscus. Meniscus. Those menis- fuck, guy. Those leg. Those were they leg locking you? No, it was just uh, just starting to to roll with someone, and just my knee locked up, and he oh, pushed oh, me, oh, and oh, I, oh, my oh, knee oh, got oh. stuck, and. Here's why, here's why I fell in love with it. Because yeah. it is the only sport I've tried that teaches you viciously it's okay to fail. You are oh, absolutely. You're literally having some guy either try to choke you unconscious or separate a limb from your body. And there's no beginner's luck. No one shows up on day one and does okay. People get no. smashed. So you yeah. get humbled, but at the same time, you still come back. And so being not, not just losing, like... Uh, often being humiliated someone's sitting on your face while they put your arm in a kimura or something um you learn okay life's fine i'll come back and i'll try again that is a very important lesson my friend because as adults we hate to fail we we say things like oh it's not for me because we're just afraid to fail anything i can do to make myself more comfortable with failing and trying again i'll get into it and that's exactly what that sport's about yeah, and I feel like the the pain that they they can bring, you know, like on chokes or 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 uh, like you know like kimuras and stuff like that. Like, I feel like you learn very quickly. Like, don't go that way when you're, you know what I mean. Don't turn that way because then you're gonna get x choked or mm-hmm. tapped out very quickly. Mm-hmm. And you can always, you're, but you can always just stop. You a little tap on the shoulder, you're done, and you can't you can't muscle out of it very often. So it's no. it's it's a relatively safe sport, but there are <laughs> the, <laughs> the knees just get oh, wrecked. Knees, unfortunately, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Which country has the best cuisine? Mexico. Mexico. Listen, people think Mexico is like nachos, burritos. You go down. (laughs) 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 You go down, like, walk a street in Mexico City, and there's like huaraches, sopes, pambasos, uh, all these things, and you're like, oh, this is is Mexican food. Dude, there's things here, like, for example, um, um, like a food called pulque, uh, which is this fermented cactus sap that is so thick, it's like paint, and they give you a paint stick to stir it. It gets, it gets served in one, one uh, liter mugs, and there's flavors like oyster and peanut and like uh, marigold, <laughs> and it's the, the old Aztec kind of like emperor's drink, this big frothy mug of sticky sap. And it almost was eradicated from Mexico, but it's still around. And so you find all of these super interesting things in Mexico. There's, there's two places in the world. Yeah, Mexico and maybe like um, the archipelago, like Indonesia, Philippines. Those two places are the most fascinating, man. But Mexican food, you don't even know. You don't even know. I, I, I've only been like off resort in Playa del Carmen. 
in terms of like Mexico. I haven't done Mexico pro- properly. Mm-hmm. Like I need to do Mexico City, like the Oaxacas, the coasts. Yeah. Like that's uh, it's a it's it's definitely one on the bucket list. Mm-hmm. Tell me your best travel hack. Whoa, I should know these these hack things, but I um, I've been, I've been living it. I've been living it too long. I would say the biggest travel hack is this. All those reasons that you're saying, oh, I can't because of this, I can't because of that, I have to wait for my friend, I don't have enough money. I'm not saying your excuses are stupid, but for 99% of you, your excuses are stupid. It's fear. Fear gets in the way of every big decision in your life. It gets in the way of travel as well. And over and over again, it's like, how can I travel like you? What do I do here? It's people just generally don't want to make tough decisions and jump into the unknown. It's a terrifying thing, honestly. Mm. But the world's not as dangerous at all compared to what you think it is. Mm. And I would say, at least how I, for myself, because I've got a lot of bullshit excuses too, my my strategy is always this. Okay, what do I want to do? Okay, let's say it's travel to South Africa. Oh, I can't be... Okay, if someone put a gun to my head and said... You have, you have to travel to South Africa. Could I make it work? And most of the time, the answer is yes. Again, there's people who have special circumstances, but think about that. If you really had to make it work, could you? You just choose, you, you give yourself the excuses to not do it. Well, the thing is, your mind is so good. It knows all of the perfect things to say. You know, It knows exactly your weaknesses. It can say everything that it needs to say to make sure you don't do anything. So just keep that in mind. You know, you know exactly what to tell yourself to make yourself not do it. So try to think Stop about Stop thinking. Just fucking do it. <laughs> there you go. New tattoo. <laughs> have, you, have you read uh, David Goggins' book, uh, Can't Hurt Me? Mm-hmm. He's a machine, man. I, I don't understand how people cannot read this book and just start running like mid, mid-read. Yeah. This guy's he's insane. A, he's a machine. So inspirational. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But he's kind of saying some of the same stuff you're saying. It's just, mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, we get in our heads too much about it. He's a beast. What's the most underrated country? I would say countries that I... I okay, well, Oman is what the first one that came to my mind. Oman is a place that no one goes. <clears throat> I mean, partly maybe because it's beside Yemen, uh, which is mm-hmm. a country you don't want to go. And also besides Saudi Arabia, which is controversial, but it's not that dangerous there. Oman is kind of like the Switzerland of the Middle East. Um, it's incredible. It's relatively peaceful, for sure. Not a dangerous country, uh, but also extremely cultural and all sorts of wondrous places and things to do. And So I would say, think about that. Um, not the cheapest country, but it's not so bad either. Uh, another one that people judge a lot is Pakistan. Pakistan's a fantastic place, filled with like some of the friendliest people in the entire world. Um, I can't. Yeah, uh, those, those those are good answers. Those are the two that come to mind for sure. I I feel like I feel very proud right now, Mike, because this is uh, I guess this in the last two podcasts, this is the second person that has mentioned Oman as being a very underrated place. Who was the other person? Uh, So I had Daniel Stables on. He's a writer, travel writer for BBC. Oh, cool. uh, For Nat Geo. Like he's done, he's a freelancer, but he works for a multitude of companies and uh, travel guides and stuff like that. And he also did some stuff in Oman and was just saying how awesome it was. It is. Yeah, it's great. Uh And I think his only complaint, and his only complaint, I think, was it was expensive for beer. But yeah, well, because it's illegal. (laughs) (laughs) I think you you can drink it in your hotel. Yeah, exactly. You can only there's no this there's, there's liquor stores, but you have to have a special a special license to buy liquor from the government. And also, generally, all bars are in the basements of like the Hyatts or the Hiltons. So there's mm-hmm. not really a drinking culture there. But you know, one yeah. thing I've noticed, dude, over the years is even the cultures that don't drink, everybody gets every the whole world has to get fucked up. If you're not drinking, you're, you're there's something. And so even in some of these Muslim countries where they don't drink. Uh, they're up until or... well, some again. Pakistan's full of weed, but even like in Turkey, there's not there's some drinking there. They're not they're uh, on paper a secular country. They say non-religious, yeah. but it's very, still quite Muslim. There's they just chain smoke cigarettes and drink espresso at midnight. Like 
<laughs> Even That's like, not a drug, eh? No, I mean, exactly. Everywhere I've gone, there's some kind of drink or fermented shit or something you smoke or something. Anyway, every country has something. I think it's part of the human experience. Like we said earlier about the religion where we have to almost disassociate ourselves to be able to see the full picture. Every culture does that in some way. Tobacco, you can do, I've learned you can sniff tobacco, you can chew tobacco, you can stick it up your butt, man. There's a, there's a, lot, of, a lot of similarities between, uh, between cultures. I mean, I haven't done that one at last one myself, okay? But I know it happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> where did you experience the least friendly locals? France. Whoa. There's something about French culture. And I Paris really... or France? What? Paris or France? Uh, I'm going to say, I'll tell you my experience. Sure. And, and I hope I get proved wrong. And if, if any French people are listening, this is my experience. Okay? Mm-hmm. So this is what it is. I'm from New Brunswick, right? You know that. Um, mm-hmm. Growing up, we would go to Quebec often, uh, usually for these fencing competitions, swords fencing. And I remember I had, I had several bad experiences. Uh, going there and trying to speak French because I was in French immersion from grade four to grade 12 in Fredericton. And I would go to these competitions. I'd try to speak French because we were in small towns and they would get upset with me for trying to speak French. And I thought that was kind of demoralizing, but I didn't know at the time. I started to travel the world and learned a little bit of Spanish here and there. And I, I found out that Countries generally love when you try to speak their language. You go, you yeah. learn a couple words, and like, hello, how are you? You get a big smile, and they, it's a whole fun thing. Every other country in the world's like that. But when I went to France after a couple years of traveling, the same thing happened. I tried to speak French. And again, I'm okay at French, like definitely upper level, in, like intermediate, let's say. And just with disgust. And it's the only culture, and I witnessed that both in Canada and in, and in France, uh, where they did not like anybody trying to speak their language. At least with me. Maybe, maybe my French is just so bad <laughs> that, that it offends people. Uh, but it's the only... I've been to like 80 countries. And You've I been always... Some African countries too, like that, that you were speaking French in. in yeah, in like Cong- Congo speaks French yeah. as well. Mauritania speaks French. And that was very useful in those countries. Uh, the French is very strange there. Also, you know what? Louisiana speaks some French. You know that? Yeah. Do you know yeah, like... Yeah, of course. The Cajun well, culture, you, yeah. So I didn't yeah, really... Well, do you know the Acadian and Cajun connection? Yeah, I didn't realize that until I went down there. I was like, oh shit, Cajun, Acadian, they got kicked out of Canada, je me souviens, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, so like mm. uh, Acadians celebrate, uh, like I'm an Acadian, and like the August 15th is kind of the Fête des Acadiens, it's like the day that they celebrate, you know, the, or remember the day that they got deported. Mm-hmm. And a lot of Cajuns, like Louisiana folks, come up to New Brunswick and wherever there's like the Congre Mondial. Mm-hmm. Yeah. To be fair, Acadians have always been very nice to me. And Quebecois up in like uh, Gaspésie, super nice too. Rock, yeah, rock stars. Yeah. It's, yeah, no, I, listen, we get that as well. As, as a native French speaker, we, like, I used to live, uh, I guess, on the border. So, like, we, you know, go get some beer or go to Quebec City or whatever. And sometimes, so just didn't, like our, didn't like our brand of French. Yeah, that's it, right? And so, I'm, I'm interested to hear that you had similar experiences being a much more native French speaker than myself. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it, it definitely happens. But, you know, you throw a Quebecois in France, and they're going to get the same treatment. So, I don't know <laughs> if it's, like, kind of a class class system that you know the the top bullies the bottom you know what i mean the second yeah. biggest speaker and anyways um so you've been to a number of festivals around the world which did you find the most interesting interesting <clears throat> well um the, there's a festival call well there's a, a month long period in Sulawesi, Indonesia, which is the very middle of the archipelago. The island's kind of shaped like a, like a llama or a camel. Mm. Um, not a very popular spot for tourists, but there's a, a location there called Toraya. And for one month a year, that's when they have all the funerals and also these things called menenes. So um, basically what happens is you have your grandfather, let's say, who passes away. They don't believe you die they believe you get sick when you die and so they keep the body in the house for one two three five years even 
and everybody from around the world can come and they can say their final goodbyes. Um, even though the person's super dead and decaying. <laughs> they, they bring in the food. They bring in food from every day. They sing. They put on the favorite music. And then they say that, uh, and they also ask the dead questions. Sorry, the sick, they say. Gran- uh, Grandpa's just shy. Grandpa's face is like falling into his teeth. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> yeah. And um, there's a YouTube video about this too. And so, again, their idea is that so everybody in the, around the country or whatever can come say the final respects. And also that the, the sick person can give them answers to their questions. So in the wind and their dreams and the ayahuasca trips, whatever they're doing, right? Uh, they're not tripping on ayahuasca. I'm just checking the joke. <laughs> uh, and then what happens, they have a big funeral where the, they put the body in this, uh, this casket and they spin it around and the, they slaughter 40 water buffalo. So, and it's, they spend, I think, 50,000 US dollars, this family who runs, a, like they save up their entire lives for these funerals. What? The biggest party ever. They, again, sacrifice 50, 60 water buffaloes. And then what happens is they put them in a, in a cliff grave. There's like a family cave cliff grave that are carved up by hand. They seal it up. And then every 10, 20 years, they open it back up. They take out the bodies. They stand them up. They change their clothes. They say, oh, look, it's Grampy. I haven't seen Grampy since, he, you know, like 30 years ago. And Grampy's there like a desiccated skeleton with still his sunglasses on his head and his army hat. They take off his sunglasses. They, they put on, they, the kid puts it on. They hold up Grampy's head. They make him talk like a Muppet. And it was so fucked because... I realized in that moment that our view of death is so different and hang with those guys. I don't know which one's better. Like at one point I was hanging with my guide. I'm like, Andrew, man, this is crazy. And he's, he's like, he's like, this is crazy. You, when, when your grandfather dies at home, you, you just rush and throw him in the ground. What if someone has, what if someone wants to go say goodbye? What if they can't? And then like, you just, you never see them again. You just bury them and you forget about them. You never go back. You never care for them. Like th- that's not what you do with family. And I was like, honestly, bro, you kind of got a point. I can't, I can't fight with that. We're, we're afraid of death in our culture, right? We don't, we, we throw it away. Oh my God, it's gross. We have closed casket. We, you know. We, we yeah. rarely go back to our, our, our dead relatives' graves. R- rarely. There's a graveyard, but like how often? Like I, I wish I did it more. Maybe my excuse is travel. But honestly, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't be doing it every year, I guess, you know? Yeah, but I mean, if they're dead, like they're, they're not like it, their body's there. Like it's, you know what I mean? It's, I, I feel like maybe they're, like what, what religion that part of the world has or is it whatever is most prominent maybe has an impact on like I, i'm interested to kind of they believe in reincarnation it. so then it's not okay, they do. yeah uh they believe in reincarnation so if you don't believe that your grandfather's really there then i guess it's not i don't know i don't know man it, it was fascinating um so that was the most interesting but i have i have to give a shout out to one i witnessed here in mexico again why i love this country there's one that's called um uh, well, they call it just the, the bulls of fire, basically like uh, Toros de Fuego, where it's like running of the bulls in Mexico, sorry, in Spain, but yep. these are homemade, car-sized, rebar-enforced, bull-shaped bombs, basically. This country, this, this city called Turtepec is the capital of firework making in Mexico. And if you've ever heard about ex- firework explosions killing tens of people, that happens here. And they have a national fireworks festival week where the, the last event is everyone makes these like big, again, like kind of like paper mache, but like bombs where inside is filled, completely filled with, with commercial grade fireworks. And they parade them through. It's a fun little parade. And then when the night comes, they, they light them all. And one after the other, every, let's say, 15 minutes from sunset at 7 until 4 or 5 a.m., there is a bomb going through a town square trying to run you over like running of the bulls while it's exploding and shooting rockets at you. And people Jesus die, God. people get burned, they dance in the sparks, they get run over because they can't, it's just like a bunch of smoke and fire. So I wanted to film this because it hadn't really been filmed before. And I did not know I what I was, why. I did not know what I was getting involved, man. That, that, very rarely have I been in situations where I am afraid I'm going to get seriously hurt. It might be a surprise, right? But I told you, I do a lot of due diligence. Hmm. But I, I, I thrive in chaos, but I want to be able to 
to know that I'm somewhat in control, right? Like I understand that festival, man, every direction, fireworks, like shooting out like, like surface to air missiles, boom, boom. And then also the bulls coming out of the smoke pushed by a bunch of drunk dudes, people just throwing tequila bottles across the crowd, boom, tequila. <laughs> and like people just like fist fighting. So they, were, they brought out one of the bulls and someone came and pulled like one of the horns. Another guy just like punched him right in the face in front of me. Like, you. And then there was a brawl. People were like, getting, it was just chaos. Chaos. Holy shit. Uh, lo- I mean, loved it. Uh, <laughs> that sounds but, intense. Yeah. Again, there's a video about that too. Bulls of Fire Festival. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw it. I was just like, holy shit. Easily like, I, the craziest thing I've done. You got immense- some great shots, man. Yeah. Well, I had a Sony A7S, so like a really nice low light camera. Threw a GoPro on my head. Got like right in the middle of it all. It, um, but yeah, I got I got a couple scars that day. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> holy shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was a crazy one. Uh-huh. But again, Mexico, you can do that shit in Mexico. Most other countries, there's too many rules. Not here, you can get away with some fun stuff like that. Well, what's your situation with Mexico? You're, I know it's your home base. Are you a resident or? No, currently still a resident of Canada. But looking to change that, honestly. Um, I don't need my Mexican residency here. I move around too much. Uh, I just most, you, can get, you can pop in here as a Canadian and get six months, easy. And then right. uh, as long as you don't spend more than... Six months a year? I, th- I don't think they even care, bro. It's like a know. maximum amount of tacos you can eat? No. Isn't, until you <laughs> poop the bed, basically. <laughs> That's the thing about street food, is that I would much rather have a massive selection of street food and get sick one out of every hundred times than have no selection. And like Canada has no selection. Like mm-hmm. there's maybe, like it's not even hot dogs. There's like food trucks, maybe. Yeah. But yeah. I'll, I love rolling the dice because, yeah, they're not all great. And yes, sometimes you'll get a little bit sick, but oh man, cheap food, cheap, delicious homemade food. Oh, can't beat it. I think, I think too, like if I look back at the amount of times that I've been sick off food, the one that sticks out to me is Burger King in Spain. Right. Yeah. Same. Again, me, 7 Eleven. Never, right? never mm-hmm. eat Burger King again. Fuck that. Mm hmm. What is your favorite cocktail? Moscow Mule. Hell yeah. Moscow Mule, uh, rum and coke as well. Also, or dark and stormy. Anything that's like got uh, some lime in there. Even margarita. I think I just like lime, man. Margarita as well. It's good margarita. But off, off the top of my head, uh, Moscow Mule for sure. But the problem with Moscow Mule is that you got to find a place that does it well. It's one of those cocktails that it's not like a rum and coke. There's like very sp- like ginger, getting good ginger beer and getting yeah. the good copper cup make the massive difference they do yeah absolutely so i've had to to modify this next question because everybody was giving me the same answer uh so now i've had to change it to i've had to modify it slightly so where did you find your most expensive pint most expensive pint yeah i used to go cheapest pint then everybody would say vietnam beer street uh, right? i was gonna i was i saw that question i was gonna say the pulque <laughs> uh most expensive <laughs> or, pint. okay well i'm interested what's the pulque so the, I'll, I'll, I'll answer the cheapest pint or like, yeah, uh, that's okay. what people want. I just, I just don't want to always hear Vietnam, Vietnam, Vietnam. I see. I see. I see. Well, the, the, again, this pulque drink that I talked about. So you can find some really cheap mugs of this stuff. And again, the story behind it's really interesting. So it's a, it's a Mexican thing, usually around Mexico city. So like it's a Mexico state, Estado de Mexico is where you can find it in the, in the, the deserts mostly, but Mexico city has lots too, but the story is super cool. And I've had some really cheap mugs of that. I wouldn't say it's good. I wouldn't say it's the cheapest, <laughs> um, but the story is super cool. And I like places that have cool stories. So basically yeah. the, the story of this drink is that it was again the 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 the, let's call it the beer of mexico it was made with sticky maguey sap basically and so after a hard day's work the boys would sit back and they'd chug these big frothy mugs and this was how it was up until like the mid 1900s where the beer companies started to push into mexico and they saw that there was already a drink in this niche which was pulque right and they did something really interesting. So <clears throat> they couldn't crack it uh, because people wanted to just drink local and they all had their routines. Mm. So they started to say that pulque was fermented in the same barrels that would hold human waste. 
So pulque, again, it's, it's kind of believable because it, you, you have to ferment it in a big barrel, like we're talking pirate ship barrel, you know what I mean? And it only has a shelf life of like two days, three, it, it, very quick. And it can get pretty funky sometimes, man, if, if it's getting on the, the older side of things. So the, the beer companies came in with this disinformation campaign on purpose to spread lies that pulque was fermented in shit barrels and that you want to have, oh, you know, sexy beer in this nice glass. Look how healthy this is, you know, like with the bubbles and the clear, the clear mm. container. Mm. And it worked. And they almost eradicated pulque completely because they everyone wow. wanted to drink beer. And that, you know, and so with that, it, it almost went away. But recently, there's more, a bit more of a resurgence of, of this drink. And again, there's some funky flavors, like I said, oyster and beet like red beet but then but has has, mm-hmm, has anybody fact checked if it actually was no i think it was bullshit yeah yeah marketing bullshit propaganda uh but like some of the best flavors are like peanut is pretty good uh like mango is pretty good you can have it straight with no flavor only for the brave uh but again it's pretty cheap and you can have it in a lot of spots in Mexico, and it's got a really cool story. And uh, you go into these. I remember the first pulqueria I went to. Uh, I walk in. It's got all shaved uh, wood on the floor, and people are just like throwing peanut shells there too. So it's like sawdust on the floor, peanut shells. The waiter comes over, and they didn't have a tongue, so they come over, and they're like, they didn't. They weren't speaking, and they just point to the menu, and I didn't know what was happening. But it turns out they didn't have a tongue, so they they couldn't speak. Uh, and the second time I went back was. Um, someone who was like a trans trans man trans woman like big guy big beer belly with red lipstick and a wig and he took my order <laughs> and it was great and there's a guy come in with like two two teeth and an accordion singing songs and these are the kinds of places you'll you'll find pulque which is like the old the old guys the old the ogs who know the old days still wow. drinking this drink yeah it's it's incredible man uh that's so look interesting it up. yeah I might have to change it to pool case till takeoff. I don't know. We'll, we'll, see. we'll see, dude. I'd say I'll bring you some, but it doesn't travel very well. <laughs> no, probably not. Where in the world is your favorite bar and why? Um, hmm. And why is it Dolan's? Why is it Dolan's? Dolan's. <laughs> I never was a big... I used to be the a guy at the Phoenix, man. There was this dance bar in, uh, yeah, in Fredericton. Called, oh, it still exists, actually, doesn't it? The yeah, yeah. Com- it's, but it does, it's capital, yeah. But it doesn't... The Phoenix doesn't exist anymore, I don't think. It's, uh, they bought the complex, I think, and it, like the Phoenix is maybe a room now? Yeah, 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 yeah. I used to... Interesting thing about being a break dancer is that we used to go clubbing all of the time. And it wasn't necessarily to drink. It was just to, like, to throw down, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Push everybody back. And- yeah, and so even now... And I didn't realize at the time it, it was going to be one of the best travel skills of my entire life. Because, again, I said everywhere likes to get fucked up. Everywhere dances, everywhere plays yeah. music. You can be on, you can be with the sea gypsies, the Bajau, Bajau people on, on a platform in the ocean in Indonesia. They still sing and dance, right? Or the Amazon, or again, Dolan's. Pick a, pick a spot in the world. Everybody sings and dances and plays music. And so being able to be comfortable dancing was this amazing skill that I use all of the time. You would never expect it to be that. But it's a language that you don't, that you, once you learn to speak it, it's international, right? So, yeah, um, yeah man. Uh, Clubs, not quite sure, but dancing itself, I love it. I still do it a lot, and it's valuable, very valuable. Absolutely. All right, so let's get into the story. Story time. Let me tell you a story with my deep podcast voice and my podcast microphone. This story just happened about a year and a half ago. Uh, so I have the YouTube channel. We spoke about it. I like to find unique adventures that generally haven't been done before. I grew up as a Boy Scout in Canada. Love being outdoors. Very comfortable camping, making campfires, you know, setting up tents, all that kind of stuff. And so I found this interesting niche of camping in crazy places. And I had done a few of, of these episodes already where I'd get dropped off in a remote part of a certain country, like Romania. I found this uh, really interesting castle, old, old ruins, went up there, camped all by myself, heard these ghost stories of the old maiden who guarded it. And it's just, it's interesting, right? It's, it's beautiful. And as a Canadian, we don't see castles, right? There's like Chateau Frontenac, and I can't even think of anything else. So these old no, ancient, yeah, exactly. These old ancient castles just fascinate me. 
And I was traveling in Turkey looking for another spot to do one of these, you know, solo camping in an abandoned castle videos. And over there, there's castles everywhere. Like, if there was a castle, well, there is one in Canada, but again, it becomes a national landmark. But over there, there's just so many, you can't possibly preserve them all. And I found this place in the remote northeastern part of Turkey called Satan's Castle. Ominous name. Right up my alley. Great YouTube title name. Hell yeah. So it was called Satan's Castle. And it was, you had to take um, uh, two hours from uh, the nearest big town of maybe like 100,000 people. You drive up in the mountains. There's a couple of little shanty towns. You go past all of them. And then the road ends and you have to hike probably about 25 minutes along a ridge. You dip down and you find this rock monolith, this tower that kind of juts out of the gorge. And on top of that, you have Satan's castle. A bit like um, the, the, what was the castle in Lord of the Rings 3, Return of the King? Anyway, this, this castle perched on top of this rock tower. The perfect defense, right? Natural fortifications. Only one way in, one way out. And so I, I, I rented a car. I drove the two hours, drove by these little shanty towns, parked it. And took my backpack with like my drone and my firewood and all that stuff. And I was walking along the path to go find this castle. I saw it. It was perfect. You couldn't. It's exactly what you'd picture it would be. It's right out of the medieval times. And it's about midday. Um, the sun was going to be behind the mountains in about three or four hours, around 4 p.m. Because we were so high. And uh, so I go and I explore and I make my little YouTube video and I'm having a good time. And then the sun start, starts to hit the, the crest of the mountain. So I make my little campfire and having a great, like, just explore, like, be living like a medieval king. You know, there's, mm -hmm. there's the murder holes where they would drop down the, the, the hot uh, um, oil. Like, it has everything. A big tower in the middle, still intact. An old chapel on the side that was, like, destroyed but still had, like, church artifacts. It, oh, it, was, it was fantastic. And so I'm there. The lights are going down. One thing that was a bit peculiar, though, is that there was like um, floodlights that were positioned around like the outside of it, but the, all the wires were cut and the lights were smashed. So at some point, someone had decided to light it up, I guess. But again, we were, we were so far from anybody. No one would ever be able to see it lit up. But all the wires were cut. Anyway, I was kind of pumped because I didn't want a bunch of floodlights in my face as I was camping at night. So fine, whatever. That detail is going to be very important later, by the way. So um, I, I realized that as I was filming, I must have dropped my, my head torch, my headlamp, back in the beginning of the, of the castle. So again, light's coming down, the, the sun's coming down over the horizon. Um, I had my campfire, had some food. I'm like, all right, well, one thing I like to do just for the, the cinematics of it all is make an old school hand torch with fire. So I usually bring in uh, the, the ingredients for that. Just like a stick and some, some wire and a cloth and some kerosene. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, it'd be cool to go walk around, get some shots with this torch, and also be able to find my actual head torch because, you know, a, a fire torch isn't that efficient if, if anything goes wrong. Yeah. So I make my fire torch and I set up my tripod and my, and my camera and I'm getting these really cool exploring shots. I'm going to put voiceover on it later. I'm just living the fantasy, right? Like the old school. Like what's the last time someone would have walked with a torch there? thousands of years ago or something and i'm going i'm going i'm going and then i look at the path that i walked on on the other side of the ridge so there's like a the rock tower right that i'm on top of there's a gorge that cuts a, across and on the other side there's the, the trail that kind of snakes along the other side of the gorge and i look and there's a couple like little floodlights that were put on the path and again it's kind of weird but all right that's fine but i look and there's a, a group of three guys i think standing maybe about a half kilometer or full kilometer on the other side of the gorge, looking over where I am. And it's getting a little bit late. It's like 10 p.m. Um, and again, I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm like, that's kind of weird, but it's fine. And then they, I can tell they see me, and they begin to scream bloody murder like I just had sex with their mother. Like they, <laughs> they, are, they are screaming like no one's ever screamed like that at me before. And so I'm like, oh, shit. So I put up my little torch, and I'm like, idiot. <laughs> and um, I'm just kind of like, I poke behind a rock. I'm like, what are these guys, what are they doing? And then, gunshot. <laughs> Zips over my head. What? And I immediately fell into a state of confusion. Who are these guys? I'm in the middle of nowhere, right? Why do they have guns? And was that shot at me? 
And so I'm, Holy shit. I'm tucked behind this rock, and they still scream. And then another gunshot, again, in my direction. Definitely was at me or around me, right? And so very interesting thoughts start to come in my head. What do I do now? There's only one way on, one way off this rock castle, right? This natural land bridge that oh. connects to the path that they're on. My car that I parked is at the base of the path that they're on. I don't have my stuff with me. I'm away from my campsite. So like my passport, my everything's over in the tent. Um, I have like my camera and some bits and pieces and my phone, but not, nothing, not, nothing to stay, you know, to defend myself or like, should I defend myself? Like, wh- who, what do they want? Are they, are they, are they, maybe they're hunters trying to catch, but those shots were directed in my direction. So in that moment, I, I was like, well, what you have to do is you have to get to the car, but I, I couldn't go back and get my keys. So luckily I had my backpack with a few basic essentials in there. But just like my phone and, again, camera pieces, just luckily I have my phone in my backpack. And so I put, I take my phone, I, I didn't have a flashlight, so I just pressed record on my phone only because I didn't want to use the flashlight. And I knew if I pressed record, I could use the, the dim light of the screen to see where my feet were. Yeah. And I, I, they're, at this point, I was trying to hustle back to the tent, but they started sprinting towards where I was. So the three guys start running towards, again, the, the one way entrance exit to this castle and so i see that and i'm like I, I i can't stay here like they're obviously here to get me there's this isn't a misunderstanding like they there's like they are, they are they are looking for me and i figured if i said screw it to everything in my tent and i ran out the path i was closer to the exit entrance than they were so i could probably get out and start to scale the mountain and like hide myself on the bush but the problem is that it, it's like a 70 degree angle and there was like some rocks and things there but i don't i don't know what i like but that was the only option i don't know if i could actually make it to the top but at least i could hide there and they would think i got away or something so i sprint again i'm I'm just trying to find where my feet are not trying to put so much light i get out the the front exit i start crawling up the side of this cliff and i hide behind a bush and they three guys come streaming past me and they're screaming, screaming, screaming. And they stop, right? And they have a flashlight. And they're scanning the flashlight. And it goes right by the bush I'm in. And I'm just like trying to be as small as possible. And I try not to make any noise. And then they keep walking. Oh, fuck. And so I try to climb up. A rock slips again. I'm terrified. They didn't quite notice, but I, I was scared to move. So they go inside. They, and, they, and they go to where my campsite was. And then uh, I can hear them like messing with my stuff and everything. And I'm like, well, like I've got my passport there. I've got all this stuff. And, and at that point, I have my phone, right? And uh, I call my friend, a local Turkish guy who was three, four hours away. Normally, I would, I would get someone to help drop me off. And then they would leave me there and I would camp. And there would be somebody around like not like they're there, but within a half an hour in case something happened. But he was hours away. We couldn't make it work. I was trying to do this on the way to something else. So I messaged my friend Suat, and I'm like, bro, there's people here, and they're trying to get me. And he goes, they're terrorists, man. Um, if they Don't let them find you. And if they find your things, they're going to steal your things. So just try to hide. I'll call the police. So Holy like, shit. Oh my shit. And it was really cold. It's November in Turkey. It's very cold there. So all I had was like, you know, my pants and, and T-shirt, but it was like getting down close to freezing. And so I wait for like 10 minutes, 20 minutes, and these guys are still shooting, shooting guns in the air. Bam, bam, six shots, seven shots, eight shots. Does it still sound like yelling. a handgun or is it like a, like a, like a rifle? Yeah, they had a pistol and they had a rifle. Jesus Two. Christ. And uh, still shooting, still yelling, still looking for me. They're not leaving. And then um, I'm like, well... I- Maybe I can try to make it up the cliff, but again, I don't have the keys are back. The keys to the car are back in my tent. What am I? I can't spend the night out here, man. Like I'm going to die of hypothermia, you know, and how do I get back without them seeing us? So I'm trying to figure out everything and I hopefully the police will come and they'll figure it out. So I get a call back like about an hour and a half later and uh, or a message back from Suat and he goes, okay, great. The police are there. They got there like 45 minutes ago. And I'm like, okay, well, um, are you sure? Because there's only one path. Like, I haven't seen them come. He goes, no, they, they were there. They, they were, um, someone actually called them before I even called them because they were, they were looking for a, a terrorist and a treasure hunter. And I was like, oh, shit, like, well, well I would have seen them. 
And then I realized something. Like, no one had been there but me. And so these guys were the police. They were the military <laughs> police. And that the locals had saw some dude with a bunch of weird tripods and shit and thought I was a treasure hunter because I didn't know at the time but there's a very famous treasure some princess's treasure buried in that castle that no one's ever found and that's why those lights were there and also the reason why the lights were cut is because a treasure hunter had come sometime in the past a year ago whatever cut all the lights and at the very entrance there was a circuit board that controlled the lights someone had smashed that as well so the military police had come saw that someone had smashed the control panel for the lights, got there, saw, saw, saw that someone cut the lights, and saw some random dude with a, a, a wooden, wooden torch, <laughs> fire torch, walking around, and assumed I was a treasure hunter. And so they stormed the castle, man, trying to catch me. Holy shit. And, and so I, to shoot at you? Exactly. And so I, I, I'm back on, like, at that point, I call Suat, and I, I'm like, are, like, listen, are you sure... This is true, because if it's not, these guys, like, I'm pretty sure they want to kill me. And he goes, no, they're there. They're by your tent. They're in your study. Go back. They're waiting for you. I'm like, oh, my God. So I do the walk of shame back to the tent. And these guys are there, and they're like, Mike. And I'm like, hey, boys. And it's like, like why, why, are you, why are you here? And I'm like, I'm making a YouTube video of camping. And they're like, oh, we subscribe. What is your channel? <coughs> And I'm like, and so I give them my YouTube channel. And they're like, and he's like, oh, you run very far. And I was like, yeah, because you were shooting at me. How many times do you shoot? He goes, oh, uh, eight times. Here. And he hands me the pistol. So I mean to hold the pistol. And then, uh, so then they, then they, uh, I, I was able to get a lot of this interaction on camera. It was kind of like sweet serendipity that the best way for me to have light and not show them where I was was pressing record on my phone. So I do have some bits and pieces there. And when I came back up, they wouldn't let me film, um, but I just did an audio recording. So we have a lot of this conversation uh, on either audio or on video. And they wouldn't let me stay because they had, uh, I didn't get this part specifically, but they said there's too many wolves and bears there and that it was a problem. And so what they did is they drove me back to a boutique hotel, like an hour and a half, and we, they paid for it, and then we all <laughs> drank like Rocky, like moonshine yeah, and smoked yeah. cigarettes until like 3 a.m. together, and it was no hard feelings, <laughs> even though these boys shot eight times in my direction. Uh, why, why wouldn't you, if you thought someone was stealing shit, just like sneak up, man, or like don't, if, if this is the yelling, if, if there was no gunshots, I, I would have probably would have stayed, but the gunshots maybe gets maybe a bit squirrely, like in my head, I'm like, this is, this has got to be a misunderstanding, but you know, it just didn't, didn't feel like oh. sticking around, you know? Wow. You must've really enjoyed that racking couple, couple darts. I just like Jeez. calm the nerves. Yeah. But oh it, my god after it's like of, of course of course that's what it was right but because uh, from my experience and i've been to some of the most insane countries is that that stuff really doesn't happen right it does but the, the odds are so it's, low if you go it happens to other people and in, in in remote corners of the world like that especially it doesn't happen right people are kind man and so yeah they're they probably could have made better choices <laughs> as far as if they wanted to catch a treasure hunter but i i literally like well while, while i did feel like i was being hunted and could have been shot the real risk was i could have fallen off that cliff and, and i only had one bar of reception so if i wouldn't have been able to contact suat i don't know what would have happened right like because you would have just been under the impression that these were terrorists or or whatever or why would i think they were you. not they were they shot at me eight times right so i mean i guess maybe not at but like close and like a meter or two over my head, which is, in my opinion, at me. You know, like fuck. Even at least if they it, shoot, like that's the, their 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 intentions are are known. Like they're, they're they're willing to use deadly force. Yeah, I mean, I don't. They weren't trying to kill me. I don't think. But again, if a shot comes within two meters of me, I'm assuming they're shooting at me, right? Jesus so. Christ, man! That, <laughs> that 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 got me stressed, man. I think I think I might need some racky and a couple cigarettes here. <laughs> <laughs> But no, like I honestly didn't know how you how you get out of that one. But yeah, fuck, that's that's a that's a that's a really good one. Man. At uh, Satan, at Satan's castle, literally Satan's the name. Satan's castle, of, literally Jesus the name of it. Christ. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so Mike, I guess uh, everybody must be wondering, but what's what's next for you? 
Yeah, I know you just finished filming season two. And uh, what's what's next? Right now, I'm in the waiting room for season three. Um, I the next country I will go to it will be Angola. Hell yeah. Uh, um, I, but I just postponed it because it um, doesn't really work with other decisions I've made. Uh, but right now, I'm I'm filming an interesting series here, like I told you in Mexico, uh, where there's people in towns who again they only speak Mayan. Some of these guys actually have become expert blacksmiths over the years. And they make all sorts of interesting things out of metal. Where do they get the metal? From scrap vehicles, scrap trucks, cars. These guys can make machetes, axes. That's all cool. But they also make shotguns out of spare parts from a truck. So, interesting, right? We literally just finished filming the process of turning a truck into a shotgun <laughs> jesus christ i honestly thought that you're gonna say that they're gonna they, they, they were able to make fencing swords <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> well machetes are i guess not quite fencing swords but yeah yeah but so wow, we actually we we made um we made a, sh- a couple shotguns and then actually we, we took we went with some of these mayan guys and went hunting with the shotguns we made out of trucks and we caught a big deer and we got to see how mayans hunt they still hunt of course with these homemade guns we got to cook it mayan style underground with volcanic rock or i guess limestone rocks here so Ooh. yeah it was it was really cool um one all like another really interesting thing about it so all this indiana jones shit endless endlessly fascinates me so the deer here are actually white-tailed deer the same ones we have in new brunswick they go from canada all the way to bolivia this animal um and uh, this, there's a, a story here that in some of these deer, especially if you can find a, a male deer with the antlers, that often they'll have wasp nests in their antlers. And they have, this is one of the most legendary animals of the Mayan. So a giant deer antlers with a wasp nest. And if you're able to kill one of these magical deer, inside its stomach, you'll find something called a sastoon. And the sastoon is the most valuable jewel of the Mayans. It's not jade. It's this sastoon. And this sastoon supposedly gives you the power to become a shaman, as well makes every hunt in the future become a successful hunt. It's the most revered object in Mayan culture. And so when you kill a deer, like we did, there's a very secret private thing that happens where the person who shot it takes the stomach away into the woods and sorts through the contents to see if he's found one of these magic jewels. So, we were able to film that process and learn wow. about it for the first time really ever, which was fascinating. Again, the, a jewel found in the, the stomach of a deer with a wasp nest in its head is like straight out of Elder Scrolls or something. You know what I mean? Anyway, that's why. I, so, I'm really, I'm really pumped to tell that story. Uh, there's wow. a lot of cool shit here, yeah. So, right now, I'm finishing that. Going to do some more skydives and then going to plan Angola. Hell yeah, dude. And uh, can you remind the people where they can find you? Right. So my alias is Fearless and Far, and that YouTube's the place to be, but also Instagram and everywhere else. The TV show is called Uncharted Adventure, and you can watch it on, um, I think it's sun- Sundays or Saturdays on the Weather Channel right now. But if you yeah, type it, you can find it if you're in the States. I have a podcast called Against the Odds, where myself and a co-host tell true survival stories. Um, or you can throw my name anywhere, Mike Corey, and you can find my stuff. Hell yeah, man. Hey, this was uh, this was an amazing episode. Thank you so much for coming on. Oh, thank you, bro. This is a lot of fun. All right. You might as well catch you next time. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you for listening to Two Beers Till Takeoff. Do you want free additional content or just to stay connected with the show? Then give us a follow on our social media platform. That means TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, all of them. Are you in need of podcast production services, video editing, or anything in between? Then look no further than Strut Sound Productions, the official producer of the Two Beers Till Takeoff podcast. Music produced by Alex Gagne. Check out his work in our show notes. Voiceover done by Viking Leo K. See you next week on Two Beers Till Takeoff. Thank you